So a warm welcome to everyone. Um, I'm Keith Shepherd from World Agroforestry and Innovative Solutions for Decision Agriculture based in Nairobi, Kenya. And I'll be chairing this webinar on behalf of Constructing a Digital Environment. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, Doug Hubbard, I'd like to say a few words of introduction uh, about the program. <clears throat> uh, Constructing a Digital Environment is a strategic priorities fund of the UK National Environment Research Council, NERC, uh, cham championed by Cranfield University. Uh, the initiative aims to develop the digitally enabled environment to better support decisions by policymakers, businesses, communities, and individuals, especially responses to acute, acute events and inform our understanding of long-term uh, environmental change. Uh, this is happening by creating an integrated network of sensors, both in situ and remote sensing, methodologies and tools for assessing, analyzing, monitoring and forecasting the state of the natural environment. This is being done at high, higher spatial resolutions and at higher frequency than previously possible. Uh, the construction of a digital environment is harnessing multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary research and innovation. <clears throat> With that introduction to the program, I'd like to acknowledge NERC's organizational support uh, for this webinar. Uh, this webinar series focuses on data for decision making. It's really bringing a perspective from decision science. Uh, we have the capacity to generate and process more data at lower cost than ever before. However, in application, data has no value unless it improves decisions. So this first series aims to uh, cover various topics, including the concept of value of information, the flow of averages, new tools for incorporating uncertainty in decision-making, common flaws in the use of big data and AI, and communicating uncertainty in decision-making. Uh, we plan to have webinar series on other topics going forward into next year, including seminars from uh, network members. Uh, just to also alert you, um, the next um, network in three weeks time um, will be given by Professor Sam Savage on the floor of averages, which you can see in, in the center right. Um, and may also I draw your attention to the CDE digital trials activity shown at the bottom right. Um, this has a cash prize and chance to win a magnificent NERC water bottle, so do sign up. The web link is at the bottom right. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce you to Doug Hubbard, with whom I've had the pleasure of working with over a number of years. We published a comment article in Nature on data and sustainable development goals um, some years back. Um, Doug is the inventor of the applied information economics method and founder of Hubbard Decision Research. He's the author of uh, a number of books, How to Measure Anything, Finding the Value of Intangibles in Business, The Failure of Risk Management, Why It's Broken and How to Fix It, Pulse, The New Science of Harnessing an Internet Buzz to Track Threats and Opportunities, and his latest book, How to Measure Anything in Cybersecurity Risk. He has sold over 100,000 copies of his books in eight different languages, and two of these books are required reading for the Society of Actuaries exam prep. Today, he'll be talking about the value of information and how to decide what and how much you should be measuring. Before I hand over to Doug, a few housekeeping matters. The talk will last about 35 minutes, followed by 20 minutes of questions and answers. Um, do please type in your questions in the Q&A um, box, and uh, I will try to collate those and put, put those um, questions to Doug. Uh, the session uh, is being recorded and will be made uh, available for download later. So Doug, um, welcome and um, I'll hand over to you and um, um, that's great. Will be good. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Um, but uh, uh, Keith has asked me to speak about the value of information and I'm going to try to put this in the context of making important decisions, which all measurements should be about. And it looks like um, um, You'll need to stop sharing, I think, Keith, in order yeah, for me to- Yeah, I'm actually having trouble to find the uh, oh, stop okay. sharing button. It seems to have disappeared, so- Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I've got it now, thank you. All right, great, I'll yeah, try that Yeah, go. Great, here we go, all right, thank you. All right, so um, just to give us a little context here, um, I, uh, it, 
Keith already mentioned my book, so I won't spend any time on those. Um, let me just ask you a couple of questions to start with. Think about what your single most important decision should be. You probably work in lots of different areas. There's uh, over 80 people here on, online. So you probably work in lots of different areas. Um, but I think you might actually have the same answer to this question. I think it's how you make decisions. I refer to that as the meta decision. The meta decision is deciding how to decide. It's sort of like metacognition. Um, and then within that context too, then, uh, what is your single most important measurement? Well, in, a, in the same meta context, uh, it should be the performance of your measurement instruments for decision-making, right? So how well are you measuring things? Are you actually using calibrated instruments? And by calibrated measurement instruments, I don't just mean electronic devices, right? That you might use for very specific measurements and whichever area of science you're focusing on. But I really mean about uh, models and observations in general. How well do they uh, estimate things? What is their error? And are you actually improving decisions as a result of it? And when I talk about improving uh, the the accuracy of your measurement instruments and calibrating them, I'm talking about your subject matter experts as well and the empirical methods you're using. And of course, the decision models themselves that you're, uh, that you're uh, using to uh, leverage the results from these various sources of information. Well, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of data, a lot of research that shows that quantitative methods measurably outperform a lot of other very popular methods. And there are certain qualitative methods that don't do very well, um, but how do we start to improve on them? And can we even rely on subject matter expertise? Well, you can to a certain degree, um, but there are some obstacles to the adoption of quantitative methods for further improving that. Maybe you've run into some of these objections. Uh, think about this. Have you heard any of these objections or maybe you've said them yourself? We'd like to measure that, but we don't have sufficient data. Does that sound familiar? If it sounds familiar, uh, I would challenge you to think of that as a very specific mathematical claim. When someone says we don't have sufficient data to measure that, does that mean that they actually computed the uncertainty reduction they would get from a given amount of data, and they computed the economic value of that uncertainty reduction to determine whether or not the effort was justified? Even among my clients who are scientists in multiple different areas, um, no, they, they've never actually produced this math to justify this claim. They're, they're usually making a, uh, uh, a very subjective judgment about what is ultimately a mathematical claim. Um, when someone says we like to measure that, but we don't have sufficient data, they didn't usually actually do the math on that. Um, especially if you're talking about the math necessary to inform decisions. So I'm not necessarily, I'm not equating this math to the math that you have to do to uh, get a statistically significant result to get a p-value that's low enough for some particular finding. That's statistically speaking, that's a different question than whether or not your uncertainty about a decision was reduced. Or maybe you thought that some particular area or decision or problem is too complex to model. Maybe you've run into that. Well, uh, qualitative methods and intuition do not alleviate complexity any more than they alleviate a lack of data. Uh, whatever modeling method you're using, it's going to be wrong. All models are wrong. A famous statistician, George Box, said that. All models are wrong, but some are useful. I just point out that some are measurably more useful than others, and you can't help but model. If a model had no error, we wouldn't even call it a model. We'd just call it reality, okay? Uh, but models have errors because they're necessary abstractions. So when someone says something is too complex to model, are they just arguing that they shouldn't build a quantitative model and instead they should use their intuition? Are they claiming that their intuition is better at handling complex systems, complex situations? The evidence says no, that would not be the case. 
So I wrote my first book based on this idea that really everything I ever ran into at various clients, and I've been in quantitative management consulting now for 32 years, but I would periodically run into these objections to measurement. And I started categorizing them. And I, I decided uh, before I wrote my first book um, in about 2005, 2006, that there really were only three reasons why anybody ever thought something was immeasurable. And they're all three illusions. And they, then I summarized these in the book. And then I added on to that. It's in its third edition now, the first book. I call them concept, object, and method. The concept of measurement has to do with what measurement actually means. It doesn't mean an exact number. In fact, it hasn't meant that for the better part of a century, even in the empirical sciences. Um, we also talk about the object of measurement. That's another reason why people might think something's immeasurable. The object of measurement refers to defining the thing that you're trying to measure. This is obviously a key first step in any uh, scientific uh, measurements or observations at all. You have to figure out what it is you're talking about. Um, and then finally, the methods of measurement. Even among people who've been trained in this area, um, sometimes when we talk about methods of measurement in a different context, like, for example, reducing uncertainty about big policy decisions, that's different than the statistics you might use for, say, computing a p-value and doing a significance test on something. Um, for, for those of you familiar with those concepts, um, uh, that's a very different a question that you're answering when you determine whether or not something is statistically significant. That's not telling you whether or not you learned something, whether or not you can make a better bet. That's answering a different question, mathematically speaking. So let's talk about each of these concept, object, and method. And if you want a mnemonic, you can think of .com, C-O-M. So I'll just talk about each of these in turn. First, as I mentioned, for the better part of a century, uh, measurement hasn't meant in science, a point value. It hasn't meant an exact number in quite a while. The de facto use of the term in the empirical sciences and the most relevant use of the term in practical decision-making is a quantitatively expressed reduction in uncertainty based on observation. So you have to have an observation component and it has to be quantitatively expressed, but the elimination of uncertainty is not a requirement. Just the reduction of uncertainty is sufficient. So, you start with a prior state of uncertainty, you make some observations, do some trivial math usually, and then you have less uncertainty than you did before. That's what we mean by the term measurement. That's the most practical use of the term. And we don't want to reject a measurement just because it didn't reach some arbitrary level of accuracy and precision, okay? What we're really asking is, did it add value to a decision? What was the value of that uncertainty reduction? And that'll bring us to the, the value of information in just a moment here. But first, let me talk about this. How can I state a prior uncertainty? Isn't a prior uncertainty subjective, right? So how can I state a subjective probability for an event being true or a range of possible values for a yield of some new, uh, some new crop, et cetera, or, the, uh, or a change in commodities prices, et cetera? Well, there actually is a lot of objective uh, research about the performance of different subjective estimation methods. So you can objectively assess the performance of subjective estimates. And some subjective estimation methods are measurably better than others. There's decades of research on this. In fact, I'll, I'll cite a couple of these things. Uh, but one comes from Daniel Kahneman. He won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2002. I'll mention him a little bit later as well. But Daniel Kahneman did some of the earliest research on how people can subjectively assess probabilities. Now, we've actually calibrated over 1,600 people, uh, Keith Shepard included here. Uh, we've calibrated over 1,600 people in the last 22 years. And of those 1,600 people, uh, we took a, a big set, 434 of the most recent versions of these tests, and we looked at 52,000 of their individual response items. So these uh, trainees that went through calibration uh, went through a series of exercises where they assigned probabilities to various, uh, in this case, at first, trivia questions, but they advanced to other questions later on. Well, we can ask questions like, how well do they actually assess probabilities subjectively? And the way you objectively measure that subjective skill is you look at all the times they said they were 90% confident and were they right actually 90% of the time? 
Of all the times they said something was 70% likely, did the thing occur about 70% of the time? Well, this red curve shows how, they, how well they did before they did the training. In other words, if you look at all the times somebody in the training said they were 90% confident, they're, they're getting about 75% of them correct. And of all the times they said they were 100% confident, they're not even getting 90% of them correct. But after training, they can get very close to ideally calibrated. And what we're doing here is we're showing the effects of calibration training and other adjustments using training data where we train them with one set of data and then we look at how well they do on another set of data. And they can get very close to being ideally calibrated or within the statistically allowable error. Okay, so that SAMP, the dashed lines here are the uh, sampling error. The yellow shows where they are after calibration. And so if you're perfectly calibrated over a large number of trials, you should be right along the diagonal, right between these dashed lines. Uh, but we allow for some sampling error for the individuals that go through the training. And we've also determined uh, that when people go through this training, they actually do get better at estimating probabilities for the real world problems they're working on. Okay, so we've tracked that over time, actually. Now, there's a reason for doing this. There's, there's a whole set of mathematics that some of you might be familiar with that start with the idea that you use a prior probability. You, you state a prior about your beliefs. Um, what do you think is more likely to be true or not? That is summarized in this very simple arithmetic uh, referred to as Bayes' theorem, okay? Um, in fact, uh, there's a derivative from Bayes' theorem that we can use to figure out how well people would do if you combine multiple experts. If you ask multiple subject matter experts for their uh, calibrated estimates, if they've gone through calibration training, um, how do you combine multiple experts? Do you just average them? That turns out not to be the best solution. The, the best solution is actually uh, this equation down here. And, th and this is actually a simplified equation because it doesn't even consider how well correlated the experts might be or something like that. But it's actually a pretty close fit to observed reality. In other words, that equation is a good predictor of how often two individuals will be right if they uh, had uh, different levels of confidence about the same prediction. Okay, uh, what do we do with this information? Well, we can use it to populate models of our uncertainty. And one way to model our uncertainty, and I understand that you're going to have Sam Savage next month, so I won't spend too much time on it. But one way to model your uncertainty is using a Monte Carlo simulation. This is one way to do the math when you don't have exact numbers. There's actually research uh, that, that I cite in my books, actually, as well. Uh, there's research that shows that people who build Monte Carlos are better at forecasting than people who don't. And if you're not familiar with it, Monte Carlo simulations simply involve sampling uncertainties thousands of times using the, their stated probability distributions so that you can compute some outcome you're trying to forecast. And not only do you get, you don't get just an exact number for a net present value or return on investment or some other effect that you're trying to model, you get a range of possible values and their related probabilities. All right. So that's about the concept of measurement. I just wanted to introduce the idea that measurement doesn't mean an exact number. We can use inexact numbers. We can use probability distributions to model our uncertainties. And measurement really comes down to making observations uh, and doing some simple math to reduce our uncertainty and expressing it quantitatively. So let's talk about the object of measurement a little bit. We should ask the question, what do we see when we see more of it? Think about the hardest thing that you have to measure, even things that you think are impossible to measure. What do you see when you see more of it? If you can define it in terms of its observable consequences, you invariably start thinking of reasons that you can, ways that you could measure it. The rest is trivial math, as I've said. We also want to look at why you want to measure it. The reasons behind the measurement actually help us frame the measurement problem. Why do you care? What decision are you making differently because of this measurement? Now, you can make measurements purely for personal curiosity, entertainment purposes. You can make measurements because you plan on reselling the data to somebody else. But most of the time, I think policymakers um, and business people and people in government are making measurements is I think usually it's because 
they're trying to reduce uncertainty about decisions. So you should be explicit about what those decisions are. So let me just give you a few examples. These are some examples, all of which I've heard before. There's a lot more than this. But what do you really mean when you say community engagement or information availability or resilience? Tell me what you see when you see more of it. Maybe community engagement means reduced cost of gathering information because they're more willing to provide information. Maybe uh, you're trying to model um, some other policy where uncertainty about adoption rates among a population are, it has an effect on the benefits. And so you're trying to measure this because you think it has some bearing on some major initiative you're trying to inform. So all of these can have an observable consequence. In fact, if it had literally no observable consequence, not even one that you could imagine, I would suspect you wouldn't know that it's a, even a thing to measure. The only reason people think of things to measure is because they've seen more of it in some times, or they can at least imagine more of it in some cases than in others. As soon as you start imagining what you see more of, again, you start thinking of observations, the rest is trivial math. Now, let's look at the why question. What decision are we trying to make with each of these? Community engagement. As I said, you know, are you considering a new policy where benefits may be limited by adoption? Or are you considering developing a more intensive liaison program of some sort, right? Um, for information availabil availability, are you assessing a major investment in some new information technology? Resilience, are you considering uh, a costly risk mitigation of some sort? So be explicit about the decision you're trying to support, and we can model that decision. Again, I've glossed over it pretty quickly, but the way we model uncertainties about those decisions are with a Monte Carlo simulation. That's one good way to do it. And we can throw computing power at it then and run a lot more scenarios to get higher and higher resolution understandings of our risk about these things. So how do we go about deciding where we should reduce our uncertainty? Remember, I talked about measurement as uncertainty reduction, a quantitatively expressed reduction in uncertainty based on observation. You had a prior state of uncertainty, and then you're going to make some observations and reduce that uncertainty. Well, if you're putting together a, a typical business case, a tip, typical cost benefit analysis for some policy decision or something like that, you may have lots of variables. Uh, there may be a few dozen, there may be a couple of hundred variables. How should I decide what to measure or even how much uh, effort to put into measuring it? Well, there is a way to monetize the value of uncertainty reduction. And this has been around really since World War II, but, but it's the expected value of information. Um, it's really a net expected value of information. The equation here deals with uh, some common situations like you can be wrong by a little bit or wrong by a lot, but ultimately in its simplest form, it's the cost of being wrong times the chance of being wrong. That's what the value of information ultimately comes down to in its simplest form. Okay. In a simple binary yes, no kind of decision where you're looking at the value of perfect information versus your current state of uncertainty, it's really just the cost of being wrong times the chance of being wrong. And then we just have to deal with these situations where there's lots of other variables changing at the same time that we're uncertain about. Uh, we're wrong by a little bit versus wrong by a lot, or we have only partial uncertainty reduction, not complete. And that's the only thing that, that's really the only difference between the simple expression and the bigger equation here. So let's take a look at the consequences that has. Imagine plotting uh, information values on a chart like this. I've got an a horizontal axis where I've got increasing certainty to the right. I've got lots of uncertainty at the beginning. And as I move to the right, I get more and more certainty until maybe I can get out to a point of perfect information. The vertical axis is some monetary metric, all right? And so I can have an expected cost of information. I start gathering information and I can reduce uncertainty, but to get rid of that last little bit of remaining uncertainty costs a lot more. So the, the cost of reducing uncertainty further increases as uncertainty approaches zero. It has to skyrocket at some point. It may be impossible to eliminate uncertainty, in fact, regardless of what you spend. The expected cost of information is a, um, the ex I'm sorry, the expected value of information is a curve that goes the other way. 
the expected value of information tends to increase rapidly at first and then has to level off. Now I'm showing these just to illustrate, but of course you can compute these functions exactly uh, in specific situations uh, given a particular decision model and particular variables with stated uncertainties and so forth. But you can compute these exactly, but the curves will always look something like this. One will be convex and the other will be concave, typically speaking. And so if the EVI increases quickly at first, but it has to level off because you, you can't surpass the value of perfect information. That's a number two. Um, that's a specific value. If you were able to eliminate uncertainty about a particular variable, uh, that has a finite value to it as well. And obviously the value of information can't exceed the value of perfect information. So it has to level off. This tends to tell us that the biggest net benefit for a marginal increase in spending on measurement tends to be early in a measurement. You get the biggest bang for the buck, we say in America, early on in the process. And what this means is, if you know almost nothing, almost anything will tell you something. Often there's kind of an assumption that if you have a lot of uncertainty, you need a lot of data. But mathematically speaking, just the opposite is true. The more uncertainty you have, the bigger uncertainty reduction you get from the first few observations. That's the way the math actually works. That's the way Bayes' theorem would actually work. What else do we learn when we uh, apply this kind of method? Well, if you've got a even moderately complex decision with a few variables in it, maybe a couple of dozen or maybe a couple of hundred variables in it, um, you may find out, as we often have, that the highest value measurements in a list of variables are not what you would have measured otherwise. Uh, we've done well over 150 different projects. I think we're closing in on 200 by now, actually, where we've computed information values on uh, decision models with lots of variables. And what we keep finding is that the high information value variables are not what they probably would have measured otherwise. In fact, if if you look at a given environment with a given set of decision models uh, and come up with some taxonomy of measurements, suppose you've got 10 categories of measurements that you might engage in, sort those categories by which ones get the most attention historically to the least attention historically. How much effort do they get? Put them in that, sort them in that order. And then look at what their information values would be. Just look at their typical information values on decision models for each of those categories of measurements based on the formulas I'd shown you. Well, we've done this quite a lot in different areas. And what you'll find out is that those two lists are in different orders. And they're not just different from each other. They're almost exactly inverted. It's, all, it's not just that you're measuring the wrong things. You're measuring almost exactly the wrong things. I don't know how this doesn't affect the, you know, the GDP of nations. It would it seems like if I keep looking at every industry I look in and every government agency, and they've systematically been spending more time measuring things that are statistically less likely to improve decisions than the things they really should be measuring. Well, you may be familiar with this, but what do you really measure in your environment? You tend to measure things you know how to measure. It's not like you first compute what you should measure and what it's worth to measure it, you just really start with, here's what I know how to measure, so I measure those things. If you started by just computing the value of the measurement first, you would probably find, to be consistent with the rest of our observations here, you would probably find that you need to measure different things than what you're thinking. You look at major uh, let's say government initiatives or projects of some sort or major corporate initiatives or projects, one of the highest uh, information value variables tends to be whether or not they'll ever finish. You, If you've seen projects before uh, that were really big and got canceled, ask yourself this, did you ever see a project that got canceled when the initial business case had chance of cancellation in the business case. You know there's a chance of cancellation because things have canceled before. And of course, every project that was canceled wasn't one they thought they would be one, it wasn't one they thought would be canceled. So 
no matter what project you're starting, there is some chance of cancellation that has to be included. And that tends to be a high information value variable. I've done this in various industries, like in IT, people tend to spend more time measuring the initial development cost and less time measuring certain categories of benefits, uh, or they'll measure some administrative cost reduction without measuring, let's say, adoption rates, et cetera. Almost any pairwise comparison you make, the higher information value variable is one that gets historically less attention than the one um, that has lower information value. So let me talk about the methods of measurement just a bit here. Um, now that you've figured out what you need to measure and how much effort it, you should be willing to expend to measure something, how do you go about measuring them? Well, there, there's a lot of people with various backgrounds here, I, I believe. Uh, some of you have probably gotten involved in scientific uh, empirical research before and you've published it perhaps. Uh, but even in that group, I find myself reminding uh, my clients of some of the same things. No matter what you're measuring, just bear in mind it's probably been measured before. That's a good assumption. Any good scientist starts with secondary research. They look at previously published research when they start investigating something. Uh, I'm surprised at how rare this actually is among decision makers though. And remember, you probably have more data than you think. When someone says we don't have enough data to measure that, uh, try to be resourceful for a moment. Think further, what are, what are sources of information that would allow me to reduce uncertainty about this thing? It doesn't even have to directly inform it. It could be other indirect measurements. You look at measurements in, let's say, astrophysics or nuclear physics. By the nature of those measurements, a lot of them are highly indirect measurements. They're, uh, they're based on calculations that make inferences from other more direct observations. And you can probably do the same in a surprising variety of areas if you start thinking about it. So it's about being resourceful. And when you do the math, you often find out you needed less data than you thought. So you have more data than you think and you need less than you think. And it's probably been measured before. Now, these are just good assumptions to start with. I don't know that these assumptions are always true in every situation, but Start assuming them and then try to prove yourself wrong. Maybe you, uh, maybe uh, one of these is wrong, but I would start with these as good working assumptions first and try to prove yourself wrong. You may be the first person ever to measure something, in which case, you know, maybe you should be nominated for a Nobel Prize or something. But I, I haven't yet. I, and I, I doubt I ever will be. And so it's very likely everything I'll ever work on is something that's been measured in some sense before. So how do we bring all this together? Uh, we call this applied information economics. Um, this is really just a practical application of a variety of quantitative methods where each of the methods that we utilize, starting even with how we frame problems and how we elicit subjective estimates from experts, as well as the various quantitative methods we use and the empirical methods we use, every single method we use here is something where we can point to research that has large clinical trials showing that some methods measurably outperformed others. So based on the components that we found that are the best performing methods, we always start with defining a decision. No matter what you're trying to measure, you define a decision, you model your current state of uncertainty about it based on calibrated estimates, you compute the value of additional information, you measure where the information value is high, and then you can optimize the decision. I'll gloss over a little bit some decision optimization issues, but that's a good process to go through. These are just some of the areas that we've applied this over the years. We've prioritized investments in aerospace and biotech and pharmaceuticals and medical devices, risk return analysis on large IT project portfolios, military, government, not-for-profit, large engineering uh, risk analysis, et cetera. Night and day different, in fact, in many areas. This is just one. This is actually one of the projects I did for the United Nations. Um, and this is a model, a very high level, you know, cartoon representing major components of a large Monte Carlo simulation where we were working out the economic uh, impact of restoring the Kabuchi Desert in Inner Mongolia. So this was a uh, UN environmental program project that I was involved in, and we built this large decision model so that we could compute the uh, impact, the economic impact over a long period of time. It was actually a 50-year period of time, and we had lots of uncertainties, and because we have all these uncertainties, of course, we're going to have uncertain uh, impacts, but fortunately, 
uh, we can reduce our uncertainty further. This model had lots of variables of different sources. There was a large number of variables that required entirely subject matter expert inputs. They had to be trained first so that we knew how good they were, they were at estimating things. Okay, we don't just use uh, subject matter experts uncalibrated. We have to calibrate them just like you would any other instrument that we'd use for measurement. Um, many of them were based on other secondary research at first or other historical data that local authorities might have had. So that's the initial state of uncertainty. We still have measurements to make, but the information values tell us where we should focus additional measurements. And it turned out that the highest value measurement by a large margin was again, not something they would have measured otherwise. The biggest uncertainty was daily wages in Kabuchi project area laborers. Now that was one variable in a large model working out the economic impact, but that was so uncertain that it turned out to be a major information value. Um, and there was, of all the crops, there was a particular crop where reducing uncertainty about the yield was higher information value. And they even had some uncertainty about the initial and in fact, ongoing cost of, of desert restoration. And that was addressed with just a more detailed cost model. So we uh, created a more, much more detailed cost model where we had more components where we could rely on other em empirical data about the cost of various activities, et cetera. All right, so I think I've just about run out of time and uh, certainly feel free to contact me if you have any questions. This is my email right here. And as I always tell people, you know, measure what matters and you can make better decisions. And so uh, I don't know if we have questions now, uh, Keith, but I'm happy to stick around. Yeah, we have um, one question from Mark Colverley who's saying, have you applied this to climate change issues? How do we optimize observations to support climate change mitigation? I would say the my best answer to that is we've built models that included climate change as variables in the models. So I haven't had the opportunity yet to apply it to climate change itself, but we've certainly used the outputs from models like the CMIP models um, in other decisions that we're modeling. So we include the outputs of CMIP models and their uncertainties in other things that we're modeling. And of course, those are pretty informative for big important decisions that people are making. The question you would start with, though, is um, what uh, make sure we're framing the decisions. So think of the portfolio of public policy decisions we might be making uh, as a result of better measurements here, right? Um, sometimes I think there's a tendency to just uh, throw more money in a particular type of measurement that we need more sensors or more data in some area without really working out in advance. How would that change? our un states of uncertainty in a way that would inform the you know, set of decisions better. You know, think about it that way. Thanks, Doug. <clears throat> um, I have one from Ben Swallow here. Um, mm -hmm. How do you respond to variables or models that change through time? Oh, well, you certainly don't want to do that in your head. You, I would say that it, those are the very sorts of things you want to model quantitatively. You want to model your uncertainty about the change as much as your uncertainty about a current state. I mean, the models that we build for environmental programs are typically 50 year time spans. Okay. Um, even in the pharmaceutical industry or civil engineering problems, those are typically 20 or 30 year uh, forecast. And of course, we have lots of uncertainty, especially the further out you go. But because of that, that's why we want to be explicit about quantifying uncertainty. And in fact, we have a lot of data on how bad we are at forecasting future things. So we allow for plenty of uncertainty the further out we get. There, there typically is quite a lot of good data on uh, how much things change. And there's even good data on catastrophic changes that are relatively rare. Sometimes people say, you know, this is a new technology. We don't have any data on it. Yes, but you have lots of data on in introducing new technologies. Or um, in California, we don't have a lot of data on huge wildfires like Camp Fire, which happened you know, a, a little over a year ago. Camp Fire in California was a huge fire. And, uh, but in fact, that's within the distribution of historical fires, especially when you take into account increased drought periods, which we expect to see more of, right? So, you know, we can only deal with those if we do the math and we can't deal with them if we try to do it in our heads. Remember, 
no matter what model we create, we're going to have a model with error in it. But we have no choice but to model. Even our intuition is a model. So the right way to think about these things is which modeling methods do we have reason to believe measurably outperform other modeling methods? Often I'll build a quantitative model and somebody might say something like, how do you know you have all the variables or all the correlations? And I say, well, of course we don't. If we had all that, we probably wouldn't call it a model. We'd call it reality. But it's an abstraction of reality. So the only question is, are we using modeling methods that show that they measurably outperform alternative modeling methods, like our subject matter expertise or something like this? Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Uh, so I've yeah. seen a couple of questions that came up in the chat as well. Um, there's one, um, you know, how can you apply this to remote sensing applications, say the classification of certain crops? I mean, I think probably your answer is that you know, this, this can apply to any kind of problem, really, but I'll let you answer that. Yeah. Oh, sure. Well, again, what's the decision, right? Um, is remote sensing going to give you higher resolution data that would inform specific policies? Like imagine how you would make the policies decisions differently or the intervention decisions differently if you had higher resolution data. And maybe the remote sensing is going to be better at getting you that data faster. Well, is the change in time going to have a relevant impact on the decision making, right? So you, you still want to start with modeling the decision there. Yeah. I've got a question here, Doug, which I know you've dealt with um, a, a lot, and it's a common one. And it's how would you measure variables that are linked to human interactions, like respect, for example? So, oh, um, well, yeah. fortunately, um, humans are measured frequently. <laughs> there's, there's whole fields of study about measuring humans, right? Uh, so, uh, yes, um, for example, but let me take respect for a moment there and dive into it further, because I think this is a great classic problem of something that seems initially intangible. I would ask the, uh, the person who posed the question, what do you observe when you observe more respect? You must have seen cases where respect exceeded respect in other cases. So I would start there because I'm not sure I know actually is one way to, to start. I'm not sure I know exactly the context of what you mean in that, for that particular item. Yeah. And, and I suspect, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Can you finish please, Dr. Yeah. Well, I suspect that the reason you're interested in measuring something like respect is because uh, perhaps you're looking at, you know, some sort of intervention of some sort. Um, maybe, uh, understanding respect is going to have something to do with forecasting other behaviors. Remember, um, if you're measuring something to inform your own actions or the decisions of others, et cetera, um, you're really forecasting a couple of things. What would happen if I didn't do this and what would happen if I did? So what behaviors are you forecasting that would be different depending on this decision you might make one way or the other? Thank you. Um, there's one in the chat here. Um, how do you deal with local scale data uncertainties and the role of local stakeholders? Well, what's the what's the particular problem there? Uh, so, uh, I mean, uncertainties, um, the math behind it isn't different for scale, right? We could we could deal with uncertainties at very tiny levels. I, I do Monte, I did a Monte Carlo simulation when we looked at which house we were going to purchase. That's pretty micro scale. And we do Monte Carlo simulations for giant global issues. So the scale's not really a problem. The, the math for uncertainty is the same. Uh, so was there a specific issue you were thinking of that maybe I could dive into further? Um, Let me know. Well, um, yeah, Bhopal can, can put that up if uh, he can uh, think of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the meantime, um, you know, I'd um, just like to also reflect a bit on you know, how, how difficult it is often for researchers to define the decision. Um, you know, I, um, we, we, we mentioned this in, in your book some time back, but you know, I went into a research organization and interviewed uh, uh, most of the scientists and I asked each single, single one in turn, you know, how does your research support decision-making? And that, that was a very tough 
um, answer, a question for most people to answer, actually, and it does right. require a lot of reflection and research, and I think that's been your experience as well. Yeah. Right, and I, I, I don't discount the uh, the value of purely exploratory observations in science. Uh, there, that's not a problem, but I would suggest to most researchers that if you're trying to get funding and you're talking to agencies that might provide that funding, put it, putting it in context of decisions that you would support makes a business case for your research, right? So that's one reason to think about it. You're, you're affecting the decisions of others. And the more explicit you can get about that, the better you're going to be able to make a case for the people who might provide funding. Yeah, so I've got um, quite a long question here. Um, in many environmental scenarios, the economic value is obscure, if not just intangible. Uh, in particular, the what matters uh, differs between different decision makers like departments and government. Is there a need to have decision makers clarify their needs and do we risk falling into the trap of low value of information by delivering information we think they need? Oh, sure. Well, first off, the last sentence is a testable hypothesis. I would test that hypothesis. I'm not sure that's the case. Um, but um, the fact that uh, inform that the fact that economic impact is uncertain, even as you said, obscure, um, is the re very reason we do probabilistic analysis. If we didn't have uncertainty, we wouldn't need probabilistic methods. Um, you wouldn't need statistics, really. You would, everything as it is. Most of statistics deals with making inferences from un from incomplete observations, samples of larger populations, et cetera. So there's lots of room for uncertainty in the way that we do things. It's the whole reason we do these sorts of things, Monte Carlo simulations, et cetera. Uh, that's exactly why we do it. But you also use the term obscure. Um, if obscure means unknown or uncertain, we have a way of modeling that. If it also means ambiguous, that is something you can't avoid. Uncertainty is unavoidable to some degree, but ambiguity is not. We can figure out what we mean when we say things. So what do we mean by economic impact? Do we observe that standards of living will increase? Well, let's get specific about the standards of living. And what's the value of those standards of living? I mean, if, if I say everyone having access to clean drinking water is at least as valuable as improve safety in a work environment. Well, that's a that's actually a quantified choice. That's a preference that you've stated quantitatively. And you can state preferences like that quantitatively. Or would you rather, um, uh, what's the trade-off? Would you rather increase everyone's income by 2% or half of the population's income by 40%? Um, well, so I was, um, those are good questions. Yeah, Alex was sort of expanding there that he was thinking about biodiversity as an obscure, well, not just intangible value. I mean, I know you maybe that's something you've come across before in one of your problems, but um, I guess you would start to say, well, you know, what 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 impact would you expect to see if there's more or less biodiversity? Uh, is the way you'd probably get start to get at that. Um, yeah, right. I mean, there are um, you can imagine and. I, and uh, this is something that we should be modeling, right, in great detail, but um, the, a, a biosphere requires diversity, right? If you had some fraction of the species you currently have and you have uncertainty about the interactions and necessary dependency among those species and among those uh, systems, those ecosystems, well, you might actually uh, risk more catastrophic collapse, which have which would have other impacts on humans as well. Not that you necessarily have to uh, limit your valuation of economic impact to humans. You can, you can value whatever you want to value. Um, there's lots of ways you can express values explicitly and quantitatively, but I do recommend uh, explicitly and quantitatively stating your values. Uh, you tell me what to optimize and we'll try to optimize for that, but you do have to be explicit. It doesn't really help a really any kind of policy or program to be ambiguous about what it is we're trying to do.
I, it's a great exercise, by the way, if you haven't thought about it. What does biodiversity mean? Are we just talking about uh, density of species in a given area? Or are we talking about more specifically particular combinations of ecosystems, right? And their dependencies. You know, how detailed do we want to get? And what is it that we're forecasting to support what kinds of decisions? I think I there's think a. Yeah, Go ahead. I, think it's, uh, I think there's an interesting point about the uh, earlier point about asking decision makers what they need. Um, it's quite possible that, you know, we're, we're always conscious that we should ask decision makers what they need, but it's quite possible that decision makers may not know what they need if they've not done an uncertainty analysis around a certain decision. So sure. by following simply the stated needs of decision makers, we might go down completely the wrong track. That's true. In fact, you know, uh, often when we start our analysis, we start working for someone who doesn't quite know what they want just yet, right? That's normal, but that's part of our, our job and should be part of your jobs as well is to facilitate that conversation to help them get specific, right? You can't do any kind of controlled experiment in some area without being very specific about what it is you're trying to do, what you're trying to measure, right? What are the conditions of the experiment, et cetera? And the same is true for decision-making. Get very specific about what the objectives are in a measurable sense, in a quantifiable sense. So if a decision-maker tells you, you know, we need more better weather data, you really have to go back and say, well, what decision are you using? Uh, is that data supporting? And really work through and analyze the decision to really come up with a sensible answer. Yeah. Right. Because I could interpret, that's a good point, Keith, because it seems like we could interpret better weather data to mean a lot of things, right? Yeah. I, I could just think of what, just more sensors? Is, is that it? Or should I have uh, better computational methods for the uh, sensors I do have, right? To make inferences about them. Or maybe I should just get completely different sensors, not just more sensors. Maybe I should try to start measuring different things altogether, right? Um, maybe better weather data has something to do with other human activities. How well are we measuring that, right? Um, if someone's trying to say we're trying to measure something about weather data because I, I want to know something about the impact on the electrical grid, well, maybe we should know something about the increased use of electric vehicles. Is that the reason why they're measuring that? That would have a, quite a bearing on that. Um, so yes, the more specific, the better. So I've got a um, question here, which is more getting into communicating uh, uncertainty. Uh, how do you communicate complex models to governments that inherently include uncertainty? Is it a matter of just distilling in information to support the decision? Um, so I think you must have done this uh, numerous times, hundreds of times. You've, um, you know, it's time to kind of communicate now the, the model results to, to the government or the user. In a sure. Simple way. So how, how, what's your advice on that? Yeah. Well, this is a pretty complicated model, actually. I'm summarizing it quite a bit right here. But when we show them this and we say, you know, we should go out and measure these things further, and that'll help you reduce uncertainty about future policy decisions for restoring the Kabuchi Desert, they understand that, right? So the model can be very complex. They're, they're not, by the way, they're not unfamiliar with very complex models on things. Uh, the financial economic world can use very complex models. There's engineering problems that have very complex models, right? So they're not uh, unfamiliar with people producing complex models. They just don't have to be exposed to all the complexity. That's partly your job. They have to trust you. They're saying, they're saying, I realize there's a lot more complexity you're not revealing to me, but give me the summary points. Oh, so here, you need more uh, resources to go out and measure, measure wages because that's going to reduce your uncertainty about how we should continue to restore the Kabuchi Desert. That makes sense. They, they get that. Um, so put it in, it, when you put things in the context of improved decision-making, I just think their understanding is going to improve. Often when people say I have difficulty communicating complex problems to decision makers, I think they might be misinterpreting their experience. I don't know if the decision makers are uh, having difficulty with complexity per se. I think it is, even at the given level of complexity, you're not telling them relevant things 
uh, for decision making. I think in my experience, if you stick to relevant decision making, they can get relatively complex. There's reasons why they're in the jobs they're they're in typically. Right. These are talented yeah, people. I mean, certainly one thing I found, you know, rings home with decision makers is um, you know, when you start talking about the economic cost of measurements and how much value it's actually giving you, um, that seems to resound pretty well. Um, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, uh, obviously, uh, measuring daily wages for Kabuchi project area laborers was not going to cost one point six billion dollars. It was yeah. going to cost a few tens of thousands of dollars. And although, a, you know, say thirty or forty thousand dollars may have sounded expensive at one point, it's trivial compared to the impact it had on the decision. So there that's the selling point. Right. So our time's about up, Doug. Um, I think that's some really valuable lessons for all scientists and researchers and policymakers here, I think, and um, something to really think through. So we're really grateful for you coming on and, and giving this talk. I think it's fundamentally important. Um, I'd just like to draw attention um, to the next uh, webinar, which will actually show you um, how to do these Monte Carlo simulations in a very simple way using very simple, sim simple tools by Professor Sam Savage and also um, you know, what the, the floor of actually not incorporating uncertainty, the floor of averages. And Doug has also been uh, heavily involved in the development of these tools through uh, his um, random number generator, which is a uh, key behind this and is, is part of that group as well. So unless, um, at NERC, you have any final uh, comments, um, I'd like to um, thank Doug very much and thank you for attending. And uh, we, um, we look forward to the next one as well. Uh, thanks, well, Thank Doug. you very much. Thanks for your time. I appreciate yeah, thanks, it. Stay well. Yeah.